<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to this uh, Helsinki Distinguished Lecture Series uh, on Future Information Technology. My name is Timo Paski and I host uh, this series of the uh, Helsinki Institute of Information Technology. This is a joint institute of uh, Aalto University and the University of Helsinki. Let me introduce today's uh, distinguished uh, lecturer. Robin Dunbar is a professor in uh, evolutionary psychology at the University of Oxford. A fellow of modern points, an active fellow of the British Academy, and Dr. Honoris Causa of Alto University. His research is concerned with trying to, um, to understand the behavior of cognitive and neural mechanisms that underpin social bonding in primates and humans in particular. Understanding of which have implications of, for the design of social network sites and mobile technology as a whole. Robin is best known for the social brain hypothesis, the gossip theory of language evolution, and the Dunbar number, the limit on the number of relationships uh, one can manage. His popular science books, which are many, include the um, grooming of it and the evolutionary evolution of language, then the human story, then how many friends does one person need, done by a number, and other uh, evolutionary works, and the science of love and betrayal. His latest book, Evolution, what uh, everyone needs to know. It will come out next month uh, by uh, Oxford University Press. And this was not a paid advertisement. <laughs> okay, today's uh, uh, Robin's talk is about uh, the dynamics of friendship in the online, in the offline and online world. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come yet again to Helsinki. Um, what I'm going to talk about really is the extent to which our psychology might limit the uh, capacity we have to exploit all the opportunities offered by the new digital technologies, as it were. Or at least what I'm doing is putting down a framework which the um, uh, technologists need to think about in order to allow maximum usage. So let me start first by just reminding you how important your friendships are to you. Um, <coughs> these are data from the famous Framingham Heart Study in, in uh, America. And what they um, show, if I can get this thing to work here, yes, okay. so if you, if you notice there are sort of two basic colours here, uh, the sort of blue uh, and the yellow, um, the, the, the uh, blue are people who are, are happy and the yellow are people who describe, describe themselves as unhappy. And I hope it's fairly obvious to you that the blues cluster together and the yellows cluster together and the greens are sort of scattered around the people who can't make up their mind. Um, and here is one indication of how bunch people can be. They choose their friends because they're similar in this case, um, uh, similar in, in psychological disposition, if you like. And what um, 
uh, Nick Kastrakis uh, was able to show with these kind of data is that your probability of becoming happy in the future depended on how many of your friends now are happy. And they also were able to show that that affected all sorts of other things. Your risk of becoming obese, your um, <clears throat> risk of falling ill, your risk of being divorced, or even your risk of dying depended on how many others of your close friends, that little sort of uh, cluster in here uh, of, of close friends that you might have, uh, have suffered that same fate. Right? So, so we're very much influenced in that way by, by, by our um, friendships, but also our friendships have these very crucial health and well-being and even longevity effects on us. And just, just to show you how strong that effect is, um, I'll show you these data. This is, this is a study which I really like um, because it's a study of the chances that you survive your first heart attack. Right? So the, the measure they're taking is, were you still alive 12 months after your first heart attack? So you can't argue with this. A lot of social psychology type, sociology type studies use ratings, you rate, how happy are you, uh, um, or, or whatever. Um, and the question always is, well, you know, I rated happiness one way, you might rate it completely different. Um, but here the, the measure is just, uh, cannot be argued with, um, it's, did you survive those 12 months? And what they've done, it's, it's a, it's a composite study of 148 uh, epidemiological, medical epidemiological studies. Um, so in excess of 300,000 people are contributed to it. And they're measuring the fact, trying to get at the factors that most influence your chances of, of surviving for that 12 months. And we, uh, I hope you'll, it's obvious here that um, uh, the quality and quantity of your friendships comes out way ahead uh, of anything else except giving up smoking. So any of the other things that, uh, that they measured and were more beyond these, so how active you were, how much alcohol you consumed, um, how overweight you were, what drugs you were on, so on and so forth, had a much, much less effect. So you'll be very happy to know that as long as you give up smoking, uh, you can uh, slob around as much as you like, you can drink as much as you like, you can be as obese as you like, um, you can take whatever drugs you like, uh, so, long as, so long as you've got some friends, <laughs> you'll be okay. And the message here in some sense is, the problem with friends to provide you with that kind of support is, you need already to have them. When you have that heart attack, it's too late. <laughs> if you haven't got them, because friendships don't appear out of nowhere. You have to invest time and effort into creating those friendships and maintaining them through time. So the whole point about friendships is their perspective, if you like, you're investing them uh, before you need them, so that when you, when you really need them, whether it's just as a shoulder to cry on when life gets too much for you, or whether it's to bring you nice cakes and, well, maybe not cakes, but soup and <laughs> things like that when you've had your heart attack, um, <coughs> uh, you already need to have those relationships in place. Uh, just a reminder, your friendships really do have important impacts uh, for you. So the question then is, is an infinite number of friends uh, preferable to having a few friends or many friends? Is there a limit on the number of friends you can have? And the answer is, uh, there is a limit, and it comes out of this uh, relationship here. This is a, a, a plot of the size of mean size of social groups in monkey and different monkey and ape species, plotted against the measure of brain size, essentially. And uh, this is what's known as the social brain hypothesis. Uh, the argument is climate is a very complex socially dynamic societies, unlike almost all other uh, animals, um, on a scale that is much greater than all other animals, as I said. Um, and uh, they need a big computer to manage those relationships. 
in order to keep those groups together. So here are the data. These are all individual species or the individual genera, actually. And it turns out that they form these four grades of sociality um, uh, in which the size of the computer is, is, is essentially increasing uh, as you go from, from left to right. So, and, and although perhaps it isn't quite as obvious here as it might be, uh, in fact these turn out to be glass ceilings, so you can go so far up that the sort of stupid monkey lying here and you hit a, a glass ceiling and you can't increase um, uh, a group size any further because of the effect that having a small computer has on limiting the kinds of social complexity you can have. So you have to sort of go over to the right to the next line uh, where you can have a bigger, more complex computer that allows you to do more and so on. So if we plug humans into this line, uh, we fit uh, right in here. Um, uh, so these are all in log scale, as, uh, as you notice, but 0.6 is it, a neocortex ratio of about um, 4 to 1, so your neocortex, basically the clever part of your brain, is about four times the size, the volume of the kind of, just as the rest of the brain deals with just keeping body and soul together. And that predicts, if you read up to the eight line, the scale of the apes and we're apes, uh, that predicts a, a value of about 150. That's what's now known as Dunbar's number. I believe it was Kristen Dunbar's number on Facebook. <laughs> which always amuses me, as I just go around the world talking about why you can't have more that friends than that on Facebook. <laughs> right. So the question then is, well, really, are human groups, natural human groups, so small? I mean, you know, we all live in these big cities, these big nation states. Um, is it really the case that we can't you know, have an infinite number of friends? This is the very first attempt by us to look at uh, the number of friends you might have. We exploited uh, the old fashioned uh, habit that people in Britain certainly had. Americans don't do this, so they were very puzzled when I first talked about it. Sending Christmas cards the, um, every Christmas to people who were kind of meaningful to you. And we um, just had a sample of people make a list of all the people they were sending cards to. Not the number of cards, but the recipients in, in the household. It's a very um, uh, wide distribution. Uh, this is Professor Kasky up here, who has apparently 300 close friends. This is me down here with very close to zero friends. Um, <laughs> but in between, you notice this very strong peak here, and the mean is almost exactly 150. And it, that number just keeps coming up every data set after data set after data set that uh, we look at, that's what we get. I'll just show you one more. Um, this is a very large data set. So this is um, 6 million telephone, mobile phone subscribers um, from one of the European countries, which I think is still supposed to be unknown. Uh, <laughs> and you'll see um, this is sort of, again, it's on a lot of scale. This is the number of people that they called in the course of a year, uh, which essentially is the same measure as Christmas cards, is all the people you think of at least once a year to, to remember, if you like. Um, and this, this very, very strong peak here, it's almost exactly uh, over 150. So it really does seem to be the case. Um, just a historical example to just show that how this is not a modern phenomenon, this has been true for a long time. These are nice data from uh, the Italian Alps, they're the, essentially the village size, the village association sizes, uh, which manage grazing rights. Um, and it, it um, uh, has a very long database uh, that they were able to use, running from about 1200 AD up to, um, I should say, 1800. Um, there. So it's, it's 600 years of demography. And of course, they have very good records because they're writing down who is entitled to be have grazing rights in, in this, this particular village area. Here's what happened to the population over that period of time. Uh, it trebled very nearly, went up by three times. But average village size, or at least association size, remained very, very constant 
about 170, so very close to being 150. Part of the reason for that turns out is that your brain actually sets a limit on the number of frames you can have. So there have been about a dozen neuroimaging studies now, following up from the very first one we did, which was published in uh, 2011, I think it was. Um, about, about a dozen other studies have been done, which show that the size of this part of the brain here, so this is the bit really above your eyeballs, um, the orbital frontal cortex in particular, and drifting up into the uh, uh, um, uh, medial um, prefrontal cortex as well, so it correlates extremely well with the number of friends you have, it is almost irrespective of how you measure it. So some people have used the number of friends on Facebook, some people have used the number of close friends, uh, some people have uh, asked uh, um, who are your offline friends, it doesn't seem to make any difference. You still get a very nice correlation between the two. There seems to be a real cognitive limit uh, that uh, operates within species as well as between species. Um, and this is tied up with what's known as the mentalizing circuit. The mentalizing, mentalizing is the ability to understand what somebody else is thinking, see their perspective on something, to understand why they're doing something or their intentions. Well. And that mentalizing circuit is particularly involved in the prefrontal cortex up here, but also uh, the temporal lobes here and the, and the uh, temporal parietal junction at the back of that. that, that those three areas for a kind of neural network uh, which are involved in processing this kind of mentalizing information, and therefore it seems managing the number of relationships you've managed. I kind of describe it in terms of a juggler keeping walls up in the air and the more skilled you are at it, uh, the more walls or friendships you can keep going without dropping one and offending somebody or causing a big row. Um, so <clears throat> there seems to be a real cognitive constraint in there. Uh, but there is something else which is important, it turns out, in terms of how your social world works. And that has to do with the fact that you have 150 friends on average, that's the average. But they don't kind of look uh, sort of like this, which is a, a complete amorphous jungle where, where there's no structure to it. They have much more uh, this kind of structure uh, set up where some groups are, are more important to you and other groups of individuals are less. If you look at the structure of your uh, social network, which we've done now with lots of um, uh, uh, data sets, um, what comes out is something that looks like this. That you sit in the center here with a series of layers running out. And that each layer, these layers are inclusive. So let's say the layer of 15 here um, uh, includes the five in the inner circle. The layer, the layer 50 here includes the 15 and so on. Um, <clears throat> what's happening is, is uh, as you go out layer by layer, the number of people being included increases, but the quality, the average quality of the relationship declines. Um, and, and, uh, originally, I had, I had um, we'll just point this out here, there's some one and a half in the middle here. Um, when the, we didn't actually know it existed, we, um, uh, we thought the, the, the innermost layer was this five uh, layer, um, and that, uh, that, that that's where it started from. You'll notice this scaling pattern here, that each layer is roughly three times the size of the layer inside it. And I used to kind of joke when I gave lectures and say, well, if you think about it, you, this is very strong scaling relationship, fractal pattern. So if you go backwards, there's a layer missing in there, and that layer should be at 1.5. And I thought it was just a kind of little joke, and I used to say that's because um, girls have two uh, best relationships, they have the partner, their romantic partner, but they also have a best friend, the best friend forever, or EFF is the um, uh, Facebook technical terms of it, um, uh, who is usually about 85% of those are another girl, about 15% are another boy, which could make it interesting, um, but they're kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of the person you exchange your secrets with. 
Um, but boys only have one of these relationships. They either have uh, a, a, a romantic partner or they have a drinking partner. <laughs> they, they, don't go to, they, don't, they can't do both at once, and therefore the average is one and a half. I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> This, this layer really does exist. But we were quite shocked when we discovered that it really did exist. But sometimes you can make a joke and make a prediction and it turns out to be right in science. Alright, so these are what these, these layers really correspond to. They're kind of a layer of intimate friends, close friends, best friends, good friends, just friends. The 500 layer, the, the red line demarcates that 150 layer. And, and each of these layers corresponds to a real jump in both the emotional quality of the relationship and the time invested in it. And the red line really demarcates the charitable limit. So you're much more charitable and helpful to people inside that red line than to people outside it. But there's um, this layer of acquaintances that runs out to about 500. We think of those. Probably a lot of those are people you work with. So you might go and have a beer with them maybe after work or something like that, but you wouldn't invite them home to your big birthday party. Right? And then outside that, there's the layer, the 1500, which seems to be memory for faces. They're all the faces you can put names to. So most of those will be one-way relationships. You recognize who they are, but they probably don't know who, who you are. So probably everybody in this room, uh, nice Mr. Trump, <laughs> will be in your 1500 there. Uh, you'll recognize them in the street. You may want to kick him, you may want not to. <laughs> it doesn't really make any difference. You recognize him. But uh, I can tell you, if you go up to him and throw your arms around him and say, Hi, how are you doing? You know, he will look at you and say, Who the hell are you? And then a very large gentleman with a big bold here will probably um, take you away somewhere. And then we've, somebody else has discovered now there is an outer layer at 5,000, and that's the number of faces you can recognize as you've not seen them before. They're, they're strangers or they're familiar faces to you, but you can't put names to them. <coughs> okay, so just to show you the scale of how your um, uh, time investment works, these, these are the contact rates per day each member of these circles, so here's the 5 layer, the 10, uh, 15 layer, the 50 layer, or at least to the individuals, now the, the extra individuals between these layers, the 150 layer and the 500 layer. You see this huge investment in these five people in the center. In fact, about 40% of your total social effort, whether you measure that in terms of emotional commitment or uh, the time invested, is devoted to just five people. And then another 20% is devoted to the extra 10 people that make up the 15 circles. So 60% of your total effort is invested in just uh, 15 people. The rest share out very decreasingly small quantities. Um, <clears throat> just to show you how general these effects are, these are data from hunter-gatherer societies. So these are the how the other societies are really the same as ours in that they're hierarchically structured. You've got families that live within kinship groups, that live within villages, that live within uh, tribes, and so on. So these are data from hunter-gatherer societies with, with four different uh, uh, grouping levels. The, the, the band here is the, at the bottom is the overnight uh, camping, if it's the camping group, the ecological grouping clans, uh, mega bands as they're called, and, and finally the tribe. You can see at least the average sizes, they map very nicely onto those, that same scale, and, and now two different data sets have produced exactly the same thing. Here's an even deeper historical thing. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an analysis of uh, Bronze Age stone circles from Ireland, but they're a very large sample. These are places that look like Stonehenge. And uh, we like to build them all the time in Britain because we had nothing to do and the Vikings hadn't yet turned up, so you know, it was all uh, peace and uh, uh, so on. And so they occupied themselves building these things. Well, it turns out that these, if you look at the size 
of these things, they turn out to have a really distinct scaling structure. And if you calculate the number of people you could get inside them, again, you see figures that are incredibly close to these numbers. So this is looks like people are building these things to suit the size, local size of the community. And this, this one I just love because it's just so implausible. <laughs> uh, it must be true. <laughs> so, as you, as you may know, um, there's been a sort of social change in fashion uh, uh, in Germany over the last 20 years, really, where people give up their flats and houses in the big city and they go and live in what are effectively trailer parks. In the countryside, nice lake, uh, you can um, <coughs> have all your amenities there, and they're officially they're now official residences for social security purposes for the government. And this uh, Tobias uh, Kurzmeier, who's a young German uh, graduate student in, in, in Oxford, came to me one day and said, I've got, I've got these data for these residential campsites. So it's not the tourist campsites, it's the residential campsites. And I'm sure it would be really interesting to analyze their size distribution in the light of these numbers. I said, this is so impossible, I don't even bother, you're wasting your time. And he insisted, so, so we did. So here's the distribution, uh, 1,000 campsites, residential campsites. These are the numbers of people you could get on the campsites. Um, here's, here's the expected, if you like, uh, sizes that, where there should be the, the key peaks. And if you do this, the analyses, um, uh, <clears throat> that those are the mean uh, peak cluster sizes um, uh, for that are in these data, and just look how close they are. And this is, you know, Mendel got into a lot of trouble. Gregor Mendel, he just discovered his laws of inheritance. After people said his 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 uh, his data was too close to his predictions to be statistically real. So I'm quite worried about this, but they, they're German data, so they must be true. <laughs> I didn't invent them. Uh, it's so that's the framework, if you like, that's the background. The question then is, has Facebook or the digital world and its opportunities changed your social world? Because it, remember, kind of Facebook, this is, what, what was this? It's offer, if you like, that the, the new digital technology could open up your social world. You can have friends all over the world, and thousands of them, rather than just the few that you are forced to have in the face-to-face -face world. The answer seems to be not. <clears throat> so these are Facebook's own data uh, produced by uh, somebody I can't remember the name of now. One of the, their regular analysts. He looked at a million Facebook pages. Uh, and took down the number of friends listed on the million Facebook pages. Uh, the scale here, as you can see, is from zero down here to 5,000 up here, which is the limit that Facebook allowed you to have. You see, there's a tiny little yellow lip there. Um, <coughs> most of those people, those Facebook pages will be people using Facebook as a professional uh, manner, so singer-songwriters using it as a kind of cheap fan club, um, journalists using it for information access. Lots of products have Facebook pages or in the Cadbury's, the chocolate makers has several uh, for its products. So if you're really stuck for friends, I can recommend um, that you go on Facebook and uh, find, uh, befriend Cadbury's Twix or one of their other products because then you can kill two birds with one stone. You can have a friend and you can have chocolate. Right? <laughs> Uh, but most of us uh, are in this very big peak here, which is uh, somewhere between 150 and 250. And sure, there's a few people that have a thousand friends on Facebook, but the numbers, proportion-wise, are very, very small. It's just that, you know, with whatever it is, one, one and a half billion people on Facebook, even a very small probability means there are enough people that uh, a thousand friends on Facebook for everybody to know somebody who knows a friend who has a thousand friends on Facebook. But in reality, most of us are down in this uh, corner down here. And, and there are several data sets. 
other essays which, which tell the same story. Um, <clears throat> this was taken from a study, uh, a small scale study we did uh, some years ago, which looked at social network size, that's really the inner core, for passive uh, internet users and active internet users, and then the emotional closeness rated on a simple 0 to 100 um, uh, linear scale uh, to those friends. And there's absolutely no difference um, statistically between uh, passive users and active users. Being an active user doesn't increase the number of people you have, and it doesn't seem to affect the emotional closeness you have. And if you kind of do this kind of analysis, so this was originally worked out with our face-to-face -face data, or some of a large number of egocentric face-to-face uh, social networks, but various collaborations of mine. We've looked at uh, several Facebook data sets. Uh, we didn't get them from Cambridge Analytica either. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, Twitter data set, and it's two Facebook data sets. Uh, these top two were uh, uh, some Italian uh, physicists that I collaborate with. Uh, so they downloaded a lot of Twitter data. Uh, there's the cell phone data set we have, which is a collaboration with Alpha here. There's our face to face data set here. And these are, uh, we're not forcing the data into these layers. This is, this, is, this is the optimal number of layers we're getting out of the data, and those are the mean sizes of the layers. And here you can see um, this infinite, infamous uh, one and a half um, layer on the inside, which we actually didn't believe existed originally. It's there, it really is there. What's interesting, though, is if you look at the size structure of primate sexual groups, monkey and egg sexual groups, the same numbers come up there too. They don't go up to 150. Their biggest groups are around about 50 in size. Exactly the same fractal pattern, exactly the same structures uh, appear as are in our um, social layers. And they turn up in the purely digital world. So these are uh, some of uh, the um, data that have come out. A very nice analysis of this uh, Austrian uh, um, online game Pardus, uh, which is a typical kind of online game, you mine things in different parts of the universe, and you buy and sell them, make alliances, and pump people off and steal their stuff. <coughs> when the guys who uh, were analysing these data um, looked at the patterns of interaction that went on among the players, and there are well over half a million players in this game, I'm not sure, I think it might have folded uh, in the last few years, but the, the data they have, which is all the years when it is in existence, what came out with these very nice layer structures to um, the patterns of interaction. And in fact, if you looked at the overall um, pattern, you had this, this uh, essentially scaling uh, ratio, uh, whereby um, each, each layer, in effect, is about four times, three times the size of the layer inside. I think that there's a layer missing right there that just didn't come up in their data sets because they were kind of using the terminology defined by the players for these grouping levels. Somewhere there, there should be another layer. Okay. <clears throat> the reason you get this layer structure has to do with time and your capacity to invest in different relationships. As I showed you earlier, the amount of time you invest in the inner core layer is huge, and then progressively it's less and less and less as you go further up. And that's partly what creates the layering. And this really goes back to the nature of our relationships and the fact that they're exactly the same as they are in monkeys and apes. And in monkeys and apes, relationships are built up, friendships are built up in a kind of two process mechanism, uh, which is quite common in psychology actually. One part uh, is essentially a very emotionally intense component uh, involving this activity here. Grooming, so uh, physical contact. Um, what it does is set up a, uh, a neurobiological uh, platform off which a second component, which is a cognitive component and involves the, the brain in the social brain sense. Both of these are really involving the brain, but one is a pharmacological effect and then the other is a uh, 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 
uh, an information processing cognitive component. Um, and what they're doing here is essentially setting up relationships of trust and obligation and, and reciprocity and so on. So I'm not going to say too much about um, uh, the second part, really. Um, I'm going to, I want to just concentrate on the role that grooming plays. We know that grooming triggers the endorphin system in the brains of primates. The endorphin system is part of the pain control system. It's an opiate. It makes you kind of relaxed and happy and contented. And we wondered whether this was all we presumed this was also true of um, uh, 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 humans. But we had no idea. We did spend a lot of time trying to set an experiment up. Um, a, 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 a brain imaging experiment in Britain um, with absolutely no effort whatsoever, success whatsoever. We applied for grants, they just said it looked boring, you're not curing cancer, they're not interested in giving you money. Um, uh, we, uh, we took the, the, the main hospital in, um, in Oxford, was very interested in doing it and collaborating with us. But their problem was they didn't have a machine to produce the, uh, to say the, the, the issue with endorphins is they don't cross the blood brain barrier, so you can't measure them sort of in the blood system outside the brain. You have to get into the brain to get them. And your best bet really is PET scanning, positron emission tomography, uh, which is painful <laughs> and involves injecting radioactive dyes essentially to people. And you have to give them two doses. Right? So you can't give them too close together, you can't give them too much radiation. So it's not a great way to do, uh, get volunteers to, to do your study. Um, uh, and worse still is these guys only have a half-life of about two and a half hours. So the, the Oxford Hospital said, we, we can't make the guys here, but we can get them up for you from London. Well, that's an hour and a half <laughs> if there's no traffic on the motorway. So we had visions of our uh, uh, radioactive uh, tracers arriving uh, because of traffic holdups already dead and useless. <laughs> so at that point, I happened to be complaining about this on one of my visits here in Lowry. Uh, and the said, oh, we can do it for you. <laughs> Down at Turku. So off they went and they did it. So uh, we, we took the view that uh, if we did it on boys, uh, we could, uh, and show that this effect worked on boys, it would work on anybody, right? Because girls are much more social than boys. So they got a bunch of uh, volunteers who went into the PET scanner, uh, had all these uh, radi radiation uh, uh, traces injected into them, and their partners uh, stroked them as you would in grooming. Um, and whoops, and sorry, whoops. In the wrong way. Uh, this is the brain rising up uh, in response to the, 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 the endorphins, in effect, uh, endorphins being pumped out by being stroked. Um, and I should hasten to add you know, they were instant. The girlfriends were instructed not to go below the belt and not to go above <laughs> the shoulder here. So just light, slow stroking. So Here's the uh, receptors in the brain just absorb, in effect absorbing um, uh, the endorphins that are being kicked out. Uh, the reason this works, it turns out, is because of a unique um, neural system that all mammals actually have, um, but we primates seem to have an abundance, I suspect, and that is uh, what's known as the efferency tactile. Uh, neural system. These neurons are very different to all the other peripheral neurons. So here's a sort of standard um, peripheral neuron for pain. Somebody sticks a pin in you, uh, a signal goes very fast uh, into the brain, and the motor cortex sends a reply back saying, pull your hand away for love's sakes, uh, and you respond to that. Um, and those are extremely fast, those neurons. The um, uh, CT neurons over on this side are unmyelinated, so they don't have any insulation on them, like other neurons, which means they're very slow. Um, <clears throat> they do not have a return loop. They go from peripheral or the hairy skin 
to the brain, and it goes specifically to the areas that uh, have a high density of uh, endorphin uh, neurons. Um, and that's all they do, and they respond only to one stimulus, and that is light, slow stroking at a rate of about two and a half centimeters a second. And that is the speed of grooming. This is sort of parting the fur, like this. So they're quite unique, and uh, um, we were kind of interested in, in uh, um, the sociality, of, if you like, of, of this physical contact kind of stuff. So one of the things that Yulia Soleto did uh, at Alto was to run this big survey. We actually did it on, um, in the end, we done it on six countries. Finland, of course, is based here in the UK, but also we got data from Russia, from France, from Italy, and more recently from collaborators in Japan. So this is essentially where you're allowed to touch people, or where you feel comfortable about them touching you, as a function of the quality of the friendship, really where they lie in your social circle. Your partner over here on the right-hand side is complete strangers on the back. On the uh, side, on the left hand side, complete strangers on the right. And the more yellow it is, the more you allow uh, 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 people to touch you, or that person to touch you. And this was done with respect to very specific individuals. Think of this person in this particular uh, uh, kind of relationship here. Uh, where would you be allowed to touch them? The black uh, indicates where you're, it's just for both them. And you'll see. The strangers, it's pretty much black everywhere except your hands. You're allowed to shake hands. Well, you're not allowed to shake hands with people now. <laughs> but you, if, if the back flu hadn't come, you would have been. <laughs> um, uh, the, the only difference really between Japan, interestingly enough, the Finns were the most touchy feely people in, in this whole song. <laughs> Now, you may wonder why this is. My theory is all that time spent in soundness. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's a value to everything you do. Um, the, the least touchy feely were the, the, needless to say, the British and the Japanese. And the only really big difference between the British and the Japanese was the Japanese did not like touching each other's feet. And we have no idea why. <laughs> and they couldn't tell us. Okay, so this is about how much time you, you spend, in effect, grooming, because that's what's happened. Because we've lost our fur, instead of sort of doing grooming actions, this monkey state, to do what we could replace it with is uh, hugging and cuddling and stroking and all these kind of things. So the question is how much time you need to spend. These are data for individual primate uh, species, again, total amount of time spent during the day engaged in social grooming, plotted against average group size of the species, Basically, group size, sorry, uh, grooming time increases proportional to the size of the group. It kind of tails off, flattens out, because everybody has to spend time feeding and, and that kind of thing. Uh, time is not infinite. Um, but the question we have to ask here is, well, given that you live in groups of 150, uh, how much time uh, would we have to devote to grooming activities, or if you prefer, just cuddling each other, um, to bond our groups of 150, if we did it with primates have. Uh, we know where the humans lie right there. We read across from the linear relationship, which is what you ought to do. Then it's, it basically says yeah, we would have to spend nearly half the day uh, uh, cuddling each other, if you want to a better word. Um, which the only people who have that amount of time on their hands and spend so much time cuddling each other as students. But in real life, the rest of us have to work to earn a living and all those kind of things. So if you look at the amount of time people actually spend engaged in social activity, it's exactly 20%. And 20% is that upper limit for uh, where monkeys and apes uh, can afford to devote to the social room. So it looks like we use the same amount of social time as my kids and age do, but somehow we use that time more efficiently so that it's equivalent to, in terms of the number of people we can room, uh, the required 45% of the day that we'd otherwise have to do. Because the problem here is that grooming is a one-on-one -on -one activity. 
Right? It's very difficult, even in humans. It's, it's, I, I suggest you just try it and see what happens. Um, even in humans, it's extremely difficult to cuddle more than one person at a time. <laughs> if, if you try it, I, I will bet you a bottle of good wine that one of those two other people will get cross. <laughs> right? Sooner or later, because you're not paying them enough attention. That's what it's all about. So the limitation on grooming, and the reason primates can't get above groups of 50, uh, at, at, at realistically, is the constraints imposed by the fact that it's a one-on-one -on -one activity. So the only way we could break through that glass ceiling is to increase the number of people you could groom with simultaneously. How do we do that? Here's what we think the answer is. So this is the grooming time up here. Um, uh, that would be required for all our fossil ancestors. These are all our fossil ancestors, different populations, they're not individual uh, specimens, they're populations, as a function of time, here the older Stratopodocenes. That's the 20% limit. <coughs> Stratopodocenes are well within that, they're just really great apes, nothing terribly exciting to them. And then it takes off as brain size increases and group size increases up to modern humans up here. So all of these data here are for extinct fossil populations, there are no modern populations here. And that's the bonding gap. We have to break, as it were, and this is how we think we did it. We did it in at least three stages. First of all, involving laughter, uh, because we share that with great apes. <clears throat> that probably came in very early on, uh, allowing that initial pump up there. <clears throat> also, it's very visceral. You can't help laughing. Right? If everybody else around the table laughs, <clears throat> and you didn't hear the joke, you still laugh. You cannot quite help laughing. Although what's interesting about it, suggesting that it's a very small, still quite a small scale thing, is if somebody else laughs on the other side of the pub, another group, you kind of look at them and go, you know, how dare they? Who are they? <laughs> right? it's, it's very intimate kind of thing. Next uh, was, was essentially singing and dancing, but singing without words. Uh, and then finally, once language kicked in, probably only half a million years, I bought them 200,000 years ago, the appearance of our own species, which is probably when fully formed modern languages came, religion and storytelling, essentially. Now, all of those turn out to be extremely good at triggering the endorphin system. I'll just show you a couple of examples. This is the first one we did. See? The original one, as we uh, um, looked at laughter originally, um, the way we test these, because of the problems of testing for endorphins, as I mentioned, is to exploit the fact that endorphins are part of the pain control system in the brain. So we give you a pain test to estimate your pain threshold, we make you do some activity like watching a video or whatever, and then we retest your pain threshold afterwards. And if the pain threshold is higher here than it is here, endorphins have been released as a consequence of this activity. And we usually do it with something like this um, <coughs> old-fashioned uh, uh, blood pressure monitor on your, 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 your arm or various other ways of measuring essentially ischemic uh, pain. Um, <coughs> what we wanted to do, so is a summary of about the first five experiments. So the task everybody did was to watch a comedy stand-up video. <coughs> this is Michael. Akita, uh, well-known British comedian, they would watch a 15 or 20 minute clip from one of his uh, uh, videos. Um, <coughs> we would measure their pain before and after. And then it's important, by the way, we do this in groups because uh, uh, people will only laugh at a comedy video or anything that comes back if they're in groups. So you are allegedly 30 times more likely to laugh at the same comedy video uh, if you're in a group of three or four people than if you watch it on your own. But our data suggests it's closer to four times more likely, but the point still holds. It's, it's a very, very intensely social thing. So we have our stimulus, but we want a control group uh, where nobody's going to laugh whatever. We're going to watch them something, and the best kind of video we found for this is golf, golfing instruction video. <laughs> because I, I don't understand why nobody laughs. <laughs> right? And here are the data. So you've got 
for each of these experiments you've got the, the comedy groups up here and the black dots and the white uh, dots and the uh, control groups watching the neutral stimulus. You can see zero marks, no, no change in pain threshold if you're above zero. Uh, there's a positive change in pain threshold endorphins released if you're below zero. Um, <clears throat> we think what happens there is that the, the, the muscles still remember the pain, so they, they can't stand so much. So the real change here, or the real difference, is not between zero and where you are, but between where the neutral value is uh, and where the comedy value is. And you can see they're always much higher. And then, um, <clears throat> not to be outdone by us, Lowry ran some people uh, through PET scanner and Toku um, uh, with the same format, what you, what you did in here. The brain is just going crazy um, with endorphin okay. pain. And, and maybe this reflects the fact that the digital world seems, or at least the digital media, seem to be much less satisfying for the way we work. So these, this is a, a diary type study where one of our students uh, had a whole bunch of people record at the end of every day their interactions with their uh, eight best friends, I think it was, um, uh, and their level of satisfaction with the interaction they had with them, depending on whether it was off face-to-face, Skype, phone, instant messaging, text, or email uh, uh, and SMS at, at the end, um, <clears throat> and including um, uh, social networking sites, sorry, SNS, so social networking sites, and email at the end. And you can see that Skype and face-to-face -face over here on the left have much higher satisfaction ratings. And we think that's because there's a sense of co-presence, the social psychologist called you feel you're in the same room together. But also, I think, it's the fact that you can see the smile breaking on their face before you finish the joke. Right? And that gives you lots of opportunities to alter your uh, what you're going to say, to judge what you're going to say next, in the light of their ongoing response to you. So if they're not smiling at your joke, you can quickly change the topic to something else because they're, they're, they're in, perhaps you're offending them or something like that. So the speed of interaction that goes on uh, in face-to-face -face interactions allows a much, much better flow. And that all these digital media, even the phone, make it very clunky uh, and, and not so efficient. And in fact, laughter turns out to be important, even in, in all these others. Uh, this is the difference between the, the rating of satisfaction on these interactions as a function of whether laughter occurred or whether no laughter occurred in the interaction. And, and laughter, real laughter in face-to-face -face Skype and the phone, but um, virtual laughter in the form of LOLs or smiley faces, that kind of thing, for, for the text-based ones. The laughter clearly has an, an important effect. <coughs> uh, here's the next one up, just give you one other. Um, this, we, we're looking at dancing, the effect of dancing here. Um, we did, actually did this in Brazil because I was persuaded, I was persuaded by my graduate student, everybody in, dance, in Brazil were brilliant dancers. Um, I realized afterwards she just wanted a free trip to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> and very nearly came back married. <laughs> um, however, in between, uh, what she did was get groups of, uh, they're actually high school, uh, um, uh, older high school kids. Um, they, they danced in a group um, in a, in a, um, uh, with music coming through headphones uh, so we could mess about with, with the dancing they were doing. They either danced in complete synchrony, so doing the same moves, or I think we were usually in groups of four, all four people doing exactly the same dance moves, just very simple dance moves, or out of synchrony, in which case they were doing different dance moves to the same, same music at the same time, and they either did it high exertion, standing up and wiggling their hips about, or they did it low exertion, sitting down, so it's just sort of arm movements. And you can see the change in pain threshold uh, goes up as you put more effort into it and synchrony of behavior increases. There's something odd about synchrony, which is very important for 
uh, uh, singing is very important for dancing. It actually occurs in laughter. When you laugh, you laugh in symphony. It's very important in religious uh, uh, rituals and so on. But somehow the symphony ramps up the endorphin effect dramatically um, for no extra effort. So it's, it has an important effect. And then she also looked at their bonding patterns, how, how immersed you feel to the other people you're doing it with, and you see exactly the same patterns. So they're doing high exertion symphony dancing, uh, ramped up the effect dramatically. What was interesting, this was only to the people they were dancing with, who weren't necessarily their friends. And they also rated how much more bonded they felt to their friends, there was no effect whatsoever. It's something that's very immediate to the circumstance. And then there's two final bits um, uh, that seem to be important and, and probably came in quite late. Basically, the forms of feasting, one is eating together and the other is drinking alcohol, which I didn't know anything about until one of my collaborators here told me <laughs> that uh, um, uh, we didn't know anything about drinking in Britain. <laughs> Finnish expertise coming in. But, um, uh, uh, alcohol is an extremely good trigger of the endorphin system. Um, and it's certainly true. We've looked, we haven't looked at the endorphin side of this, but we've looked at the bonding side. People who eat together more often or who go drinking together on a regular basis in the same pub. Um, and we did this as, as national surveys in the UK, very large national surveys in the UK. They feel much more satisfied with life. They have more friends. They uh, trust the, uh, their neighbours much more. They feel more engaged with their local community and so on. So these really turn out to be very important. I think they, they explain partly why we are so social with these things uh, in particular. But the key is you can't do either of these online. And nor can you dance and sing very easily online. You can tell jokes, maybe, uh, but you can't uh, do religious rituals so easily or uh, uh, engage in these other activities. Because what's important about them is actually to be able to stare into somebody's face, into their eyes, and see the whites of their eyes. And that seems to be really crucial, creating this sense of belonging. So let me invite you to go out and laugh, uh, sing, <coughs> dance, feast, and be merry together, because you will have more friends, you will live longer, and you will have higher fitness <laughs> uh, in the uh, uh, evolutionary sense. But you cannot do most of those things yet online. That's the challenge to the techie side of it. And my, my pitch to them always is, at this point, is if you can fix any of those and figure out how to engage people you will get and deserve the next Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we can have some uh, questions, comments, please. Um, so I was wondering, the slide with the time investment, right? Yeah. And uh, five as a number, I mean, also is close to the size of the family. I was wondering how, like, genetics plays into into the um, relationships and, and the number of relationships we have, like the size of our family and so on. I mean, I realize those are average numbers, um, but, I mean, typically people do have the best well, okay, fair enough. Concentrate per day. So, so with your family members, it would be more, and of course, if you're single, living alone, that might be less. Yeah, these are, these are really the limiting uh, frequencies with which you can see these people. Right, so that's the average uh, up there, which is a fraction of under half, uh, half a time a day. Right. Uh, for the people in, in the five, you, you will distribute them slightly differently, uh, that's for sure. Uh, because you're giving a great deal more attention at that time to the one and a half in the middle. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, like, friends, uh, as in, like, you know, friends Facebook means one thing and friends in real life is another, uh, and then you have family, right? Yes, okay, that, 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 uh, uh, 
If you think of that's the network, that is split down the middle between family and friends, right? And it's about fifty percent of them are extended family members, right? Right. So, um, <laughs> in, in terms of Facebook or other digital media, what what we infer from all this is that actually it doesn't matter too much how you do it, what the medium you use to attract, whether it's face to face or online. It kind of will work, and it works quite well for people you know well, right? Except that, because the problem here is if you invest less than these quantities uh, for each of those equivalent uh, layers, a friend will drop down through the layers and down to where your current investment is. And you know, we've shown that to be the case, so you, you know it does happen. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the issue is what's preventing that happening, uh, and things like Facebook are allowing you, as with the telephone, to keep a relationship going even after somebody's moved away, right? So where that relationship would normally disappear, right? Because they just pump down through the layer and they'd end up in the acquaintances layer at the bottom of the relationship. It doesn't take long. It takes about two months to move from one layer to the next. If you see somebody for less than a minimum time, for a layer for more than two or three months, they will slip down into the next layer. Uh, it takes about a year, sorry, two years for them to drop off the 150 layer. Um, and that's not our data, that's, that's American data, so we have to believe it too. <laughs> uh, now, now you know, what Facebook does, we think, is well, the telephone slow that rate of decay down. It doesn't prevent it happening in the end. What it does is slow it down. Because we think that you have to see the whites of people's eyes face to face uh, to keep the relationship really going. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, we, we, we could just have to There's a big sex difference how that's done, which the internet hasn't even figured out how to deal with. But it turns out that what stops relationships collapsing like that for girls is talking together. Right, so you've got to step up the amount of time you invest in talking to them. Now, Facebook's okay, telephone's better, face to face would be even better if you could meet. But talking to them is important. Talking to them has no effect whatsoever, zero, and I mean zero effect, on whether boys' friendships decay or not. <laughs> what stops their friendships decaying is doing stuff together, or as I like it, but it going out into the forest and smacking each other's heads about. Right? And, and that's what's important. It might be going drinking alcohol, often. It might be playing five sides so far every Friday night. It might be going mountaineering. It might be going you know, canoeing. It might be uh, skiing. Whatever you, the group likes to do. And it's doing that physical thing. And my, my kind of cartoon version of how this works for boys is that picture you sometimes see of two old Greek men sitting outside a cafe in the sunshine on the pavement, by the side of the table, and occasionally they take a sip of their uzo or coffee or something, perhaps puff on a very horrible looking cigarette, but never talking to each other. They're communicating. <laughs> That's the friendship for boys. <laughs> but girls wouldn't do that, they'd be talking all the time. It seems there's a big, big gender difference in how we service our relationships. So that's gets factored in, uh, but it's, it's, you know, I, I think in the end, we're very face-to-face -face tactile people, really, much more so than we Sorry, very long. Yeah. That's probably part of the idea with what we are You know, we never looked, um, and that's probably because we, went, we only discovered the sex difference quite late on, um, and it was from our high school uh, our data, although the, the data were earlier, collected much earlier, we didn't actually look at uh, that difference or that difference. Or that. So when Bromley did the dancing study, uh, we never thought to look. We must go back and look at the data, actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, I wasn't. 
I will have two questions which are in circles. Um, the first one would be uh, just quickly. Yeah, I see you, you found them here, uh, some kind of clustering method. Yes, that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, that's why you didn't find the one and a half single one in the middle of the Because it's hard to find single clusters. No, I, I think the problem was because our original data set, which set up the fractal pattern, didn't distinguish rates of contact in fine enough detail to pick up the inner layer. Because the inner layer is really daily, yeah. right? And our, our data weren't fine enough to pick that up. So where we picked it up was from traffic in online data sets initially. So that was the Facebook and the, um, the Facebook posting, the name posting, and in the Twitter accounts. And the Twitter accounts really disturbed me because these are mostly strangers that you're talking to, and Twitter, Twitter friendships don't last very long. You know, the topic changes and the kind of group breaks up and reassembles under another topic somewhere else. There was a number of Brian. That's true. <laughs> but they, you know, that means these guys who are on Twitter all the time, that is their social world. And you kind of get, <laughs> that's dreadful. <laughs> you can't dance on <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my second question would be how do you develop the time between your circles? Is there any in the Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Um, well, how is the development of the of the circles? How 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 how, 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 how high is the ratio of plants going up the layer or going down the layer? Okay, so so very very roughly. They're uh, equivalent to the five layer is, is contacting somebody at least once a week. That's the minimum, essentially. And uh, 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 the 15 layer once a month, the 50 layer once every six months, the 150 layer once a year. So those are the absolute floor boundaries. You fall below those, the relationship will fall very quickly down to the next layer. And those same frequencies contact turn up in the online data sets as well. It's almost exactly the same numbers. Um, so it really looks as though they're substituting, and, and this is one argument for, you know, if you look at the structure of, of Facebook uh, um, uh, pages, uh, um, you know, people will have maybe three or four hundred people on there, but if you look at the structure of postings, you, you see that they're, only, they're concentrating all their efforts on quite a small number of people. Um, so it, it Kind of explains what that, or, or suggests that what they're doing is largely focusing on the people they already know, and that comes out of, for example, the telephone data set that, that I showed you. Uh, that you do not, because a lot of sociologists have said to us, "Oh, well, you know, you don't phone the people you who are closest to you. You phone the people who are a long way away," and it's not true. You actually, phone, if you look at who you phone. Uh, you phone people in the five layer most often, and they live nearest to you. Um, so you're using the phone in exactly the same way as you're using face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Just say it's going around, the effort of going around and knocking on the door. And catching maps on the back of the is exactly the same. I think you answered the question I was going to ask. So uh, what is the overlap between these different ways of looking at the social structure. So you have the phone and the people you are face to face with. Are they the same people? Probably not entirely. Okay. I, I think the answer is simply that these technologies, as they, and remember they go back earlier than even the telephone. So um, you know, if, if you're old enough, you may remember letter writing, <laughs> um, which you know, has been around for really many hundreds of years. And people were using that in the same kind of way. So if you looked at people's correspondence networks, in those days you would do it with people who weren't being um, those who go and see. But I think what's happened is these layers, these different technologies have come in and just made it easier to keep contact with people. And there have been some nice studies, particularly the early texting uh, uh, data, which suggest that people were simply using it as reminders. They weren't actually saying anything. They're just saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm thinking of you. 
And that's all you need to know. So a question about that one, I guess that's the reason why the religious things are still existing and will always exist in this human culture ways because of this 150, because we are just going to church or whatever, wherever, on the globe. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, essentially the answer is, is yes, and we think that religion evolved um, really as a part of the bonding mechanism to allow these relatively large groups of about one to two hundred people to be really tightly bonded, and that was a kind of shamanistic style of religion. It was sort of going based on trance, mostly trance and trance dancing. So it was a, a personal experience. And then in the Neolithic, when you found the first settlements, particularly in the Near East, that, that created real stresses by putting everybody who lived in it, not together, started these people dispersed over quite a big area, doing all in one place. And the solution to that was doctrinal religions, because these had a moral god that looked down on what you were doing. So the village couldn't see what you were doing on Saturday night behind the bicycle sheds, that God can watch you. So that, that, that kind of, you've got two things going on. You've got a policeman in the sky, if you like, watching, making sure that everybody's behaving themselves and not breaking the, the communal rules that make the society work. But also, you've got these very intense kind of religious experiences. And we've just done a survey of um, uh, religious experiences, how often you go to, 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 to religious uh, uh, meetings, church, or whatever it may be. And exactly the same as we did with the pubs and, and, and the eating together. So then again, it really does increase your sense of belonging and, uh, and your sense of well-being and general health. All these things come together. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, I think there's no, whether you believe it or not, is completely irrelevant. It may be true, it may be not true. I happen to think it's not true, but the point is that it works to keep the people, you know, it's one of the toolkit that helps keep the community well bonded. And we have nice data which we've analyzed showing that, so this is 19th century American utopian cults, so millennial, millenarian cults, so they, you know, sort of go off and form a commune in, in the middle of nowhere and self-sufficiency commune. And the, Longevity of cults depended on whether they were religious or not. The size of foundation on average is about 150 for religious cults and only 50 for secular cults, <coughs> purely secular. And the average longevity for that size, the optimum longevity they could get, was seven years for their 50, whereas the people uh, who formed a religious cult um, the religious based cult could live in much bigger groups and their average longevity was something close to 80 years, so 10 times as long. There's something about being the commitment you make uh, when you join a religious cult that keeps the thing going. Right? I describe it rather as the, 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 the totem pole in the village green and you hang your hat on it and commit yourself to, to belonging to, to that community. It really seems to work. But that's because we think it, it's hung off or, 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 or built out of two key aspects of how we make friendships. One is what I call, which I haven't talked about all the seven pillars of friendship, which are these seven cultural dimensions that seem to create friendships. The more of them you share with somebody, the stronger the friendship is. And they all refer back to a small scale community, particularly historically, probably the community you grew up in. Uh, and secondly, the fact that the ritual, rituals that all religions use are extremely good at triggering endorphins. You have these two things coming together that we use to make friendships, which have been scaled up to create these religious effects. And they scale up very well, that's why religions work so well. Okay, so the only way to change uh, this <coughs> not so 
good human well-being is to change, uh, to make them uh, 150 groups around the world to be able to change them. This really, really religious really uh, herbs. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what's interesting is that it turns out that from other people, work other people have done is the optimal size for congregations for religions is 150. Um, and and, and Zora Lennon is suggesting that that's uh, um, uh, the ideal size, but that because that then works by personal relationships, that's what you're providing a forum in which to develop good relationships between people, they then get to know each other person to person. If you want to have a bigger religion, then you have to have a police force, or the Pope, or somebody like that, you know, the bishop. Or, you have to have a hierarchy and you have to have severe punishments. And if you have to keep it small, then everybody behaves themselves out of commitment to each other. Right? So this is exactly the same as every little village in Finland, Britain, or wherever in the world. If the village size is small, let's say under 200, everybody knows everybody else, and they all respect each other. And behave decently, courteously. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think we have to start making the uh, questions there a more uh, on the margin and then we stop after the okay. yeah, you should limit the You should limit the answers, that's the wrong one. Uh, yes, so you brought up. A lot of differences between step genders, between women and uh, men, the, from, from their social interactions. Uh, what do you think is the cause of that? There's the Sorry, differences. Can you just say the beginning again? Uh, you brought up a lot of differences between male and women in terms oh. of social interactions. What's yeah, the reason okay. for those? Okay. Yeah, I think the, the, the substantive difference is really in this inner layer is where it all starts because girls have these best friend relationships which are kind of foreign territory for boys. You can ask a boy, who is your, aside from your romantic partner, do you have a best, who is your best friend and you know, what do you do with them? And they will kind of go, well, you know, Jim, Kuma, somebody, right? But actually, sorry Kuma, um, <laughs> when Kuma goes away, I forget about him, <laughs> and I go drinking with Larry. <laughs> a boy's, boy's friendship, so girls' friendships are very intense and very one-to-one, -one, right? Boys' friendships are kind of very relaxed and kind of clubby, right? It doesn't really matter who they are. If, if, if your friend goes away to another part of the world, so you never see them, it's not a big deal, you just find somebody else to fill that slot. So my cartoon version of this, is what life is like when you're about 10. Okay? So for girls, if Penelope didn't invite you to her party, this is the end of the universe as we know it. This is a major crisis, right? Because those relationships are very intense and very personal. For boys, a friendship is standing on the opposite side of the road, kicking a supper ball backwards and forwards. Now, I put it to you that it doesn't really, for a boy, it doesn't really matter whether it's a little boy on the other side of the road kicking the ball back or a wall. So long as the ball comes back to you, that's the friendship. Right? And life doesn't change after that. So it's this intensity of within social world, which is the big difference. And one of the ways that's played out is the fact that boys seem to like clubs in a way that girls don't. So clubs which have lots of ritual, and kind of speeches, <laughs> Rich, you know, those kind of parades and things like that. You know, boys will sit there for hours in silence, uh, whereas girls work the table, they just want to have, start talking to the person. I was actually wondering, more like, is the difference, to your opinion, more like biology or society based? Oh, I, yeah, I, I'm sure this has deep biological roots, uh, because you see the same in primates. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I have two quick questions. The first is around that first part you showed, where uh, one of the things that helped with the health was around following your network. 
Yeah, yeah. my vote is assuming that size of the network did not play any role there. They never looked. What they were interested in was what your neighbour, your nearest neighbour uh, state was. And then they looked for, if you rank everybody out from your closest friend to your least close friend, just in any order, at what point did, could you still detect an influence on your future state as a result of the current state of the It was third, the third person in the sequence, but we've never, we've often discussed this. Um, uh, of the Nicholas Clark design, but we can't figure out how his way of describing the network maps onto our way yet. So to, to see what, but, but I think what you're dealing with is that five in a in a layer. How your five closest friends? Question two. So you know the second question comes from thinking about your model. It seems like this 150 number comes from a biological limit in the size or yeah. recognition. And then these layers seem to be defined by the amount of time one needs to spend ruining. So if you solved this uh, like amount of time required to spend ruining with some like technological innovation, your model would predict that the the size of each of these layers would be. Yep. Yes. So you can imagine that you have like 15 really close friends or higher numbers of really intimate friends. Uh, the answer is that's an absolutely correct prediction. Uh, the question has simply been whether it's possible to organise the time consumption in the way that would make that possible. Now, there are, these other ways we use for bonding, like singing and dancing, actually allow you to do that. Um, singing is extremely good. Uh, it, it's almost instantaneous. And now we're singing together will cause people who are complete strangers to feel they are friends and, and belong together. But all of them have limits. Laughter has a size limit of about three people, which is about the size of the conversation. It doesn't work for more than about three people, three or four people maximum. Dancing has a limit of eight people. So you can in freestyle dancing, you can dance with eight people during the course of a record and create a bond with them, uh, but no more. Singing seems to scale up much, much better. The rituals of religion scale up really well. This is the bad news. Yeah. Um, um, eating and drinking tend to be, again, small groups, right? And, um, you know, that's what we do. We, we don't make tables bigger uh, than, you know, sort of for a big function, you know, uh, uh, say 10, but normal. Dinner party size is four or six people because that's the practical limit. It's not the size of the table or the size of the house. It's the fact that you cannot get people around the table and engage in talking to each other and feel that they're part of the same group. Uh, if, if you're above, say, something like six, maybe eight, and a push. So they, they, don't, they, they don't scale up infinitely, except in the case perhaps of a scene. So you have to think very imaginatively how you do this. One more of that, okay. I think I got the honor of asking the last question. And um, I developed over the last 10 years a method to make everyone smile who meets me. So I'm especially interested in if your research on laughter also kind of extends to smiles. Because I know there's research that smile alone really you know, lower pain, lower a lot, make a lot of kind of well-being effects. Very good. And I have the privilege of the last answer, so I can keep you here all night. <laughs> um, as far as we can see, smiling doesn't have anything like the same effect as laughter does, because it doesn't create enough physical exercise. What makes laughter really work is the massive pumping that the lungs and chest do. And we've changed laughter from the way primates do it, which is, a, it's, it, laughter is a derivative of the primates' play vocalization, and the associated face, the round open mouth face. The mouth is open, but the lips are closed when you laugh. Laugh, say, ha, 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 right? Um, that's very different to smiling. In smiling, it's the opposite. You show the, show the teeth and pull the lips back. I will pull the lips back and show the teeth. Um, 
The laughter face and the laughter vocalization comes from the Quinec play invitation, face and vocalization. Uh, or we can just change how laughter is done to make it more exhausting. So in monkeys, the legs laugh, they do an inhalation, exhalation. <laughs> right? Whereas when, what we've done is drop the inhalation, we go, ha, 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 and that empties the lungs and exhausts you, and then you die of laughter, and that stress is triggering the endorphin. That's what's triggering the endorphin system. Now, the smile face comes from a completely different origin. It comes from the submissive uh, snarl uh, of monkeys and apes. It's a very submissive thing. There's been some kind of overlap in humans for the two, right? But, but basically, it has completely different motivational uh, origins. <clears throat> and we think it's probably it's done to kind of encourage people to, to stay with you in a sort of submissive way. And, and, you know, so that people who are um, juniors uh, smile all the time at important people like yeah. Professor Katsky. They, they keep him on, on sign. <laughs> uh, um, uh, whereas, sort of, you know, uh, important people don't very often smile at their subordinates. Um, uh, so it's, it, it's, a, it's motivation. So I'd, I'd be surprised if it has a massive effect. The problem is it's because they kind of mix over, one can spill into the other. So you can start with smiling and then it can trigger laughter very easily. And my guess is that that's what's producing the endorphin effect. But it's, it really is true. The more you laugh with somebody, the more bonded you feel to them. Uh, endorphins turn out to tune the immune system. They trigger the release of natural killer cells. In the, in the immune system, uh, and therefore they actually do make you healthier. So it really is true. Friends are good for you. Laughing is good for you. Singing and dancing is good for you. And even sound is a good for you because they trigger endorphins like crazy. That's why you're getting, you know, you're just drug addicts, <laughs> getting a great hit. Okay, I think we have to stop now before they start throwing us out. So let's get give a big hand to Robin.